Well, there are some things in this world, in our culture, that the only word we could really put to them to describe them would be timeless. Even beyond their utility, even beyond their purpose, it's something, there's something about them that would seem to fit, be it a hundred years ago, something that would fit today, something that would fit and still have the same kind of presence even a hundred years from now. Today's encounter is certainly one of those stories. One that, beyond just being the Word of God, when you hear the, the story, you'll see how well it fits today, how well it fit 2,000 years ago, and probably how well it would fit 2,000 years from now. My guess is somebody could take this story, rewrite it into a 21st century context in about five minutes, and if you read the two side by side, you'd barely be able to tell the difference. A household of people, two sisters, some stress-induced family drama. Well, I guess that definitely fits the 21st century. That describes just about every reality TV show in, on the television today. Decisions to be made. One sister choosing the good and the other sister choosing the better. Please pray with me. Lord, allow us to focus on you, to hear your word, and to hear how it transcends time and can affect us today just as much as it affected the original participants. Amen. The story, you've probably heard it many a time, comes out of Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. It reads, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there are some scripture characters that just seem to get a bum rap labeled on them. Martha happens to be one of them, in my opinion. Doubting Thomas happens to be another, but that's for another message. In this story, looking at Mary and Martha side by side, it tends to yield sermons or devotions that are about a dime a dozen. Be like Mary, don't be like Martha, go forth to love and serve the Lord. Done. Sorry, I'm not quite giving up on you that fast. But the fact is, most people in our world would probably be able to relate to Martha. Maybe even more so than Mary in this story. So it's absolutely no use beating her up and then beating everybody else up in the process. But if you don't believe me, I'll well, check this out. Have you ever tried to finish a to-do list kind of like this? <laughs> Hello? Hello? If so, you probably relate to Martha. Have you ever walked out of a room and done this. <laughs> Ask Deb, I probably do that about once a week at least. If so, you'd probably relate to Martha. I'll universalize it just a little bit more. 
If you've ever had friends and family over and you just wanted it to go right, you probably relate to Martha. Certainly don't let the quick read through fool you. Like I said, Martha gets a bum rap in this story. I think it's one of the only times she appears in scripture, so her name just kind of gets labeled with this story. But Martha does good and noble things in this story. Right off the bat, on verse 38. Now as they went in on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She didn't have to do it. I'm certainly doubting Jesus called ahead to make reservations, say, hey Martha, I'm coming this day. Can you make a room for me? Get a meal ready. Given how the disciples lived their lives during their time of ministry, where they were constantly not carrying around a home or something like that, but always staying in other people's houses, it's very possible Jesus had some of his entourage with him during this stay. And it wasn't just one person, but maybe a couple of people staying in Martha's home. Yet she will probably at the drop of a hat, was willing to open up her doors to these travelers, to welcome them in, to be a good host. There's no two ways about it. It's a noble thing to do. Again, something she certainly didn't have to do. And it's also proof that many of you would be able to probably relate best to Martha. Because I saw it certainly... Monday morning, this past Monday when there were at least half a dozen Marthas in that kitchen taking care of a community of people, more than I've ever seen here at one time, constantly flooding that food line. They didn't have to do it. They didn't have to do it. But they did good and noble thing that Martha does. I certainly expect Martha would have desired, on top of opening up her house, would have desired to be an excellent cook, a hostess as well. Having, you know, the Son of God and his friends over for dinner. But back then, her reputation as a woman would have been directly tied to how well she could do in a situation like this. How well she would be as a host, a hostess, excuse me. We're in small towns like that, and word gets around about how well she would be as a hostess or as a cook. So she better bring her A game now. Otherwise, just like this sort of bum rap stigma that sticks with her name in scripture, bad word would have gone around town about how Martha hosted the Son of God. There's no, unfortunately though, is no calling Salvatores or Subway to be able to bail her out on this one. But it's not just out of hopes for a good reputation that she would have wanted to be a sound host for her, for her guests. But my guess is she was genuinely in love with the man she had welcomed into her home. This happens to be Martha, the sister of Mary, the sister of Lazarus, one of Jesus' dear, dear friends who we read about later on in the Gospel. Even though he's not mentioned in the story, that's the family unit. So it stands to reason that Martha would be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of his, if you will. And when he came through that door, she would have wanted to give him her very best. Again, good noble stuff. Certainly not what you might read if you hear that dime a dozen sermon that says, be like Mary, not like Martha. Go home. But the rub comes when the good and the noble get in the way of better and best. That's why I say, when I introduce this, that one sister chose the good. I happen to be speaking about Martha. One sister chose the better. 
Martha is overwhelmed by all that it takes to try and accomplish good, that she forgets to just be with her guest. She's probably thinking about how to get those spices just right, making sure the meat is just the right temperature, making sure the, the napkins are folded properly and there's the right number of forks and the right kinds of forks in front of the Son of God. She gets so caught up in that. that basically, she majors on the minors. She concentrates all her energy on the little things. She fills her jar with the water and the sand before filling it with what really matters. Through all of it, Jesus probably would have been happy with paper towels and two-day leftovers just to have her, his disciple present, being with him, sitting at his feet. So long as he was among people who would give him his attention, that was what mattered. That, for Jesus, was the big thing. But instead, she's distracted. Literally pulled around or torn in two. These are the images that come out of that word. She probably didn't even know which way was up as she's probably maneuvering around the the entourage of people on the dinner table kind of doing one of these on her way back to the kitchen for the one more fork that she forgot. But it plays out in how she reacts to what her sister is being like towards Jesus. Maybe she tried giving her the look. Maybe even the... <coughs> Maybe even the, hey, Mary... I can really use your help in the kitchen. What do you say? <clears throat> but Mary is singularly focused on being present with Jesus, sitting at his feet, soaking in all that he could say, soaking in all of just being in the presence of a holy God. All that matters to her were. where her sister is walking around in this torn in two, pulled around kind of state of mind. It goes even further. That her one recorded interaction paints anything but the good and noble Mary that we would, or disciple that she is when, says, when she says in verse 40, to Jesus no less. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Not even going to Mary with it, but going straight to Jesus with it. Look at how it starts. Lord, do you not care? It's almost an opening that there's no room for a negative answer. There's no room for Jesus to say, no, I don't care. almost backs him in their corner and say, yes, of course I care. Yes, I'll tell Mary to go help you on. But in a distracted state, she questions whether Jesus even cares about her needs. Whether the God who would overflow her cup with his grace even cares about her needs. If she weren't majoring on the minors in this meal, she probably would never have even thought to question Jesus' care. But then in her distracted state, this good and noble person starts getting a little selfish. Mary, I know you're with Jesus, but I need you. Help me. Jesus, I know she's treating you like an honored guest, but I need her help. Tell her to stop talking to you and come help me. So we can make sure the napkins are folded right now. Spices are just right. I have to guess if it were anybody else or anybody else's house, Martha wouldn't have been freaking out the way she was. She would have been probably the true disciple that she was. Here's the thing. 
is work, service, hospitality for the kingdom of God important? Absolutely. I'd certainly never discount that, maybe even vital, as we saw Monday, here with Tyler's funeral. As we'll see maybe even today, this afternoon, as people have been up there decorating behind the scenes, getting ready for a fellowship event. But here's the point. When working for God gets in the way of being with God, all bets are off. Even good becomes the enemy of better and best. As a 21st century community, let's not be one that would stake our legacy on such things as having the best cook-offs. Although I vote that we do. <laughs> Let us not be a community that bases our legacy on having the most beautiful lawn. Although we're certainly up there. Let us not be a community that bases our legacy on having the coolest sanctuary. Let us be a community that bases our legacy that when given the chance, we'd be willing to just sit at Jesus' feet and absorb all that he is as the son of the living God. If I can tweak the song lyrics just a little bit. Seek ye first the king of God and his righteousness and all the details will be added unto you. Hallelujah.